Hello, my name is Justin Clement. Welcome to another Lunch and Learn talk hosted by the Valley Forge Park Alliance. Today we have a talk called The Medical Life and Death of George Washington, presented by Park Guide Jennifer K. Bolton of Valley Forge National Historical Park. Now, I'd like to introduce Jennifer K. Bolton. In January 2017, she joined the staff at Valley Forge National Historical Park, having previously worked at Colonial National Historical Park, so Yorktown and Jamestown, uh, also uh, at Colonial Williamsburg. She earned a bachelor's degree in anthropology and history from Florida State University and a master's degree in history from the University of California, Davis. Her professional research interests include the colonial and revolutionary eras of early America, the social history of disease and medicine, and environmental history as it pertains to health. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Bolton. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm expecting to have a bit of fun with this. So uh, before I get started, uh, just a, a few quick things. Uh, with this talk, I'm not necessarily going to do a chronological breakdown of every melody Washington ever had, but I want to use examples from his life to talk about some of the more significant aspects of 18th century theory, uh, do a jumping off point with that, and then also with the medical practice of, of the era. Uh, so we'll also discuss uh, some of the actions that he took as commander in chief of the Continental Army to maintain the health and welfare of his troops during the American Revolutionary War. I also want to say that I'll be discussing some of the more uh, some cutting edge techniques uh, that uh, were taking place in medicine at the time, uh, but by no means would I, I I recommend those today. So don't take this as a medical endorsement of any sort. Uh, oftentimes we have much safer treatments, even if they were uh, relatively effective in some cases back then. Um, so others uh, might be better for the environment. So please don't try this at home. Uh, go to your science-based doctor near you. So uh, that said, let's, let's get started. So Washington lived for 67 years. Uh, from 1732 to De December 14th, 1799. That grounds his life thoroughly in the 18th century. He spent most of it in Virginia, uh, where he's a member of the gentry class, the upper 2% of society. And uh, those in Virginia, even if they were from more, uh, uh, more modest backgrounds, uh, be they uh, sailors, farmers, tradespeople, uh, they often sought professional medical practice uh, in, uh, uh, in place of domestic medicine at times. But because of Washington's relative wealth and status, uh, he's able to depend upon the latest medical advancements and uh, uh, benefit uh, from, uh, you know, more professional attention when he gets ill. And that's not just for himself, but also for his loved ones, uh, loved ones like his stepdaughter, Martha Park Custis Washington. Uh, so when George married Martha, uh, she had two surviving children at the time. And uh, Martha, who was also known as Patsy, unfortunately at the age of about 12, uh, she started to uh, experience a uh, uh, epileptic seizures. Some of these were really quite severe. Uh, she could uh, have as, uh, two seizures a day. But I bring this up because uh, George and Martha Washington tried to do everything they could for her. And George uh, uh, had her treated for, uh, by six different doctors. And I wanna mention one of them in, in particular, this guy, uh, Dr. John de Sequera, uh, he is, op uh, uh, practicing out of Williamsburg, Virginia, which is the capital of uh, the colony at the time. Washington, he's a member of the House of Burgesses, and so uh, that's Virginia's legislative body. They often met there, and Washington's going to take his family there, and Patsy will seek treatment from John de Sequera. Uh, but uh, he's really kind of um, 
a representative of one of the predominant medical theories uh, that's in place in the early 18th century. De Sequeira, he's a, he's a pretty interesting guy. Uh, he's from London, from a prominent medical family of Sephardic Jewish descent. And prior to coming to Virginia and practicing there, he earned a medical degree from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. This is one of the top medical schools in Europe at the time. And De Sequeira studied um, under this guy, uh, Herman Borhaba. And uh, uh, some of you might be familiar with the uh, Galenic theory of medicine, also known as the humoral theory of medicine. Sometimes uh, there's, there's the suggestion that uh, in the 18th century, uh, they, they thought that uh, there, there were these humors uh, that could, could be responsible for health and disease. That goes all the way back to a guy named Galen. Uh, who in the second century, he was a Greek doctor uh, who basically organized and argued that there are four different uh, uh, substances called humors. They are blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And if there's an imbalance, imbalance of these humors in the body, they can cause disease. And so to treat the, the patient and to restore them to health, you would try to balance these humors out. But by the time you get into the 18th century, uh, there's a lot of this has been refuted, not entirely, but a lot of it. So you have uh, people like Andreas Vesalius in the uh, 1500s, uh, where he's doing a lot of anatomical discoveries through human uh, dissection. And uh, later on, you have William Cullen, uh, who he and others uh, make discoveries about uh, blood circulation, especially in humans. And then there's these budding sciences, you know, of kind of proto sciences, if you will, where chemistry and physics are starting to develop. And so Herman Barhava, he's really, uh, influenced by a lot of this, uh, but also the mechanistic theories of Rene Descartes. And Descartes uh, was arguing that the, the body and most of the brain uh, kind of acted like a machine. They resembled a working machine, and he thought that mathematics and mechanics could explain how they worked. So Borhava, uh He's actually uh, puts forward a theory of disease called solidism. And this is what a lot of practicing doctors would have actually have been taught and, and advocated in the early 18th century when Washington is around and when uh, his daughter Patsy are, are getting cared for. But Borhava, he's basically, uh, he believes that based off of the evidence that he sees, that there are these minute particles in the body. These particles uh, combine to form fibers that uh, provide stability and firmness, but uh, they also intertwine to form vessels that hold the body's fluids. Now these fluids are the sources of the humors, so they haven't gotten away from humors just yet, but those fluids, they will, uh, they will move about, combine and change according to hydrostatic, hydraulic and mechanical laws. So the body is kind of thought of as a machine. And if there's, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I have a question here. You said that he was observing particles. Is, is Borhave the one that was using the medical or the, the large lenses to be able to kind of see things or am I getting my lines crossed? Yeah, actually, it's kind of funny because I was talking about this a, a little bit with a colleague yesterday. Hi, Greg, if you're there. Uh, but uh, that's actually Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, okay. uh, who uh, was was a Dutch guy as well. Um, he kind of did science stuff for for fun, but uh, he he did lenses. He, did, he by this point they can see the bacteria through a microscope, and Leeuwenhoek is referring to that and others as as animalcules. But they haven't really figured out quite what they do. Right. Um, so, 
this is a theory that Borhov is basing off of evidence, but there's some induction uh, going on there too. So we're, uh, we're kind of like at the edge of a paradigm shift, but not enough accumulated evidence to kind of shift away from humoral theory. Right. You know, they're they're trying to shoehorn uh, the humor thing in, or or the new discoveries rather into humoral theory, if you will. Gotcha. Um, but you know, if there's there's some sort of uh, uh, malfunction in the system, you know, and how how the mechanics work, then you can have disease and. Borhava, when he was uh, when he was talking about this, he put uh, disease into two categories, or the the factors that cause disease. So there's the the remote causes that. Um, uh, so with that, you know, it's like things like your age, your um, your gender, your temperament, your constitution. So those are those are the remote causes that might factor into disease. And then there's what they call the prokatarctic causes. So these are uh, things that you can ingest, like uh, food and drink, uh, things that you breathe, the type, quality, and amount of relaxation or exercise that you undertake, and then also, uh, you know, things that come into contact with your body, like your clothing, lotion, air, that sort of thing. Uh, if you have one predisposing factor in one of those categories, but not the other, you're fine. Disease won't happen. But if they come into interplay, if you've got a, a then that's where the issue is. So, so you could have a, a, a condition, something that puts you uh, in a precondition, but you have to have those factors uh, come into play for, for disease to happen. Uh, now, Right about the time that Patsy's getting treated uh, in the 1760s, you have uh, a new theory come on uh, that's uh, developed by this guy here, William Cullen, and he's operating out of the other big university uh, in Europe, uh, the big medical school, and this is uh, the University of Edinburgh. He's really popular. He, he's uh, a popular lecturer. Uh, Benjamin Rush is probably one of his more famous students, Rush being a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, but uh, Cullen uh, argued that the source of disease um, was the either the excess or insufficiency of nervous tension in the body. So it's it's a little more easy to remember than for office. Uh, but uh, if you have too much tension in the body, then that could produce a fever. If you have too little, then a chill. And you know, there's some restorative factors that need to be put into play. So uh, at the time that Patsy's uh, getting, getting treated, uh, you're starting to see, see a little bit of both, but there's, there's some adherents that have had that training of Borjava, so that's probably gonna be the, the predominant one going on there. Um, so, but regardless of, of the theory, it's really important to remember that uh, both of these individuals, they're, they're directing treatment at the symptoms of disease and they're advocating an evidence-based approach. So we're starting to kind of depart from, from the humors, if you will. Um, Does that make this squarely within uh, the scientific revolution, uh, in your opinion? <sighs> It's the start of it, yeah. It's the start of it. Um, and, and keep in mind, uh, germ theory is, is something that's going to be developed in the 19th century. In the United States, it's not going to be fully accepted by the me medical community until 1910. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's not an easy progression uh, from, from hum uh, humoral theory or this to germ theory. There's a lot of different competing ideas about dis disease at the time. Uh, they, uh, there is an argument that miasmas or, or bad air can cause disease. And then Washington often, he doesn't really talk about humors, but you often find he's discussing putrefaction, you know, especially as commander in chief, he's, he's concerned about uh, putrefaction causing disease, you know, so like rotting straw for the soldiers bedding. Uh, and then there's a talk about from, from him and, and others, uh, uh, about um, you know wastewater 
you know, uh, the poor quality of water with, in the marshes, that sort of thing. Right. Climate and environmental factors they're, they're thinking of. Yeah. Absolutely. Which, which makes some sense. I mean, they don't know that malaria is transmitted by the mosquito, but they do yeah. know that malaria is in, within swampy environments. So, I mean, they, they are processing those connections, right? Yeah, they are. And it does take time for malaria to develop. At the time, they, they would have referred to it as intermittent fever because right. uh, the fevers often come and go and they, they manifest again. Uh, but Washington, he developed uh, uh, malaria in his teens and uh, it, it was a problem for him. It recurred uh, throughout his life. But yeah, absolutely. So now that we talked about medical theory, I do want to discuss uh, the kinds of medical treatment that Washington and others could access in the 18th century. And uh, it's interesting in particular because the kind and quality is, is really tied to uh, the location, uh, Virginia's status as a colony, at least before the American Revolution. So, if you, for those of you who are familiar with Valley Forge, uh, one of the towns nearby is Phoenixville, and it's got a, a population of about 16,885 uh, residents last time I checked. Uh, so that's roughly the population of Boston on the eve of revolution. This was the third uh, largest city out of the 13 uh, rebellious colonies that had about 15,000 residents. So if you went to Boston or New York or Philadelphia or even to Great Britain, uh, you would find a high degree of specialization in, in those areas because the population can support it. And so you would find practitioners such as druggists uh, who compound and dispense medicines, uh, but also midwives uh, who uh, help with childbirth, surgeons who uh, uh, take care of fractures, you know, set bones. Uh, they might pull teeth or perform uh, bloodletting or phlebotomy. Uh, you do also have tooth drawers, uh, physicians, and uh, uh, John de Sequera, he was a physician. Uh, so uh, they're usually university trained. They have a medical degree. They might supplement that with an apprenticeship uh, but they're primarily concerned with internal disease. We do have a related question. Uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, medical training, was Johns Hopkins the first uh, bona fide American medical school? Uh, I'm guessing it might be University of Pennsylvania, but uh, I'll let you answer. It was. It was uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, they started a medical school there in 1765. And then by the time of... Um, of uh, the revolution, you also have King's College uh, up in New York uh, that's providing um, a medical education as well. Right, King's College, uh, is that Columbia University now? Yeah, okay. yeah that is. Thank you. Uh, so of course they're gonna change that with <laughs> the name with the yeah. revolution. <laughs> uh, very good question. Uh, now that said, Washington and others, you're looking at the colonies, they're, they're incredibly rural. We, we benefit, uh, if, if you live locally here, I mean, Philadelphia is just a hop, skip and a, and a jump away, but the vast majority of the colonies is quite rural quite, and, and agricultural, and they don't usually have the ability to support much specialization. You do see it here and there, and especially with someone like Washington, who's able to afford that care. Uh, but primarily you're gonna see more general practitioners. And in Tidewater, Virginia, where he's located, especially uh, in the 18th century, it was uh, not uncommon to have someone who kind of did it all. And they were called uh, apothecary surgeons. So this is someone who can compound and dispense medicines. And you see with this painting here on the back wall, uh, there's, uh, there's some medicinal jars 
you know, some, some things that are already made, like you see with the, the blue and white to Delftware there. And then there's uh, like some of the raw ingredients in, in the glass containers on, on the left. But uh, they compound and dismiss medicines for a price. They will also provide medical advice. Druggists don't do that. So they don't engage in medical practice. They just make the medicines and then they sell them. Uh, but apothecary surgeons will also provide treatment on either on site or for a fee, they will travel to your home. Uh, they perform surgery and uh, occasionally some of them might act as man midwives. So uh, today in the 20th, uh, 21st century, we often refer to uh, use the, the term doctor and physician interchangeably. And then uh, at least in the United States, a surgeon can refer to a very specific type of doctor. But in the 18th century, it's a bit different in Washington's world uh, because uh, physicians are considered doctors. So are apothecary surgeons. They usually undergo a an apprenticeship of about four to seven years and they might supplement that with some university education or, or time away. So for example, uh, Washington's buying medicines from uh, an apothecary surgeon named William Pasteur in Williamsburg from 1769, I think it was, till 1774. William Pasteur actually uh, uh, spent uh, some time at St. Thomas's uh, Hospital um, over in Britain and got some education there on top of his apprenticeship. But uh, uh, in any case, this is, this is what you're gonna tend to see is, is more of a general practitioner in these areas. So if we're talking about like a, a lack of specialization, um, I mean, we're not gonna have dentists, for example, right? Um, okay. So it's uh, uh, apothecary surgeons, they're doing basic dentistry, is that right? Yeah, so if you see in the in the painting there, he is actually working on the uh, the apothecary is working on the woman's teeth, and they can. And of course, Washington, much to his mortification, he's well known for for his his false set of of teeth, of which he had several. Um, but uh, dentistry is actually uh, a rel relatively new field uh, of medicine uh, in terms of of professional practice. Uh, in 1766, uh, there's John Baker who, who arrives here in the colonies, and he's like really one of the first dentists to have like a, a really um, specialized training just in the teeth. And Washington's going to work with him. He works with a number of, of um, or uh, contracts the services of several dentists uh, throughout his life or, or people who can help take care of his teeth. Uh, he did try very, very hard to, to care for his teeth, but he had problems as early as his 20s, you know, with rotting teeth and, and cavities. He had a tooth pulled at the age of 24, and then just one tooth left when he was inaugurated as president in 1789. Uh, these days, uh, there's four surviving um, sets of his uh, false teeth that survive, uh, one of them is a complete set. And uh, uh, they're not wooden as many people think, though they, they've, uh, over time, the, the teeth have kind of discolored uh, to, so as to appear a little wooden. Uh, but in reality, they're made out of a, a variety of, of materials. So um, hippopotamus, uh, walrus, and possibly elephant ivory. Uh, there's also, uh, and this is depending on which one you're looking at, uh, there's also cow, horse, and, and human teeth. Uh, and uh, they're made out of lead and uh, there's some gold springs in there and metal pegs. Um, they were rather sophisticated for their time, but rather, but quite painful for Washington. Yeah, it doesn't sound terribly comfortable, especially yeah. I mean, horse teeth. You think of those as pretty sizable. I, I assume they kind of like ground them down a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually, uh, one of the more gruesome aspects to this, and, you know, a lot of people, there's, there's a lot of really fantastic discoveries uh, with the Enlightenment, of course, uh, but the, the ugly side of it is, is what uh, a lot of scholars refer 
refer to as instrumental rationality, um, in which you know you, you know you go for the end goal no matter what the, the human cost. And with dentists, they had to have a supply of teeth, and it was not uncommon uh, for uh, enslaved people and also the poor to sell their teeth to dentists so that they, they could use them because you need to have like the right type of tooth, the, the size, um, and you know, they tried to match the color of the teeth if there were any, um, if the patient still had some left. There's some conjecture about whether or not the human teeth that Washington had in his, his dentures uh, did come from enslaved people. Uh, there were some incisors in the lower jaw and um, uh, we know that Washington paid a dentist, a French dentist uh, named Lemay uh, to, uh, for removing nine teeth from his enslaved people. We don't know for sure if they were put into his dentures, but it's, it's possible. We're talking about healthy teeth being removed. From, from enslaved people's mouths. Say again? Health, we're talking about healthy teeth. I'm being sorry. Removed. Healthy teeth? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and then Washington, he also was known, um, at, at one point he did save some of the teeth that he had fall out so that they could be used for dentures too. Hmm. So, but uh, the, it, it's, it's gonna be a little more rare to define someone who specializes quite, quite this much. Um, uh, but you have a range of different practices too. Uh, in Virginia, it's not uncommon to find um, uh, black men and women who are enslaved uh, practicing uh, medicine. And it's interesting, they refer to as doctors or doctresses, but uh, Washington, he had um, an individual uh, come uh, to Mount Vernon on occasion and treat his enslaved people, uh, but they themselves um, but, and he, he mentions a Negro doctor, as he says, but he doesn't name the, name the person by name, you know, with, with his name. So he's talking about all these other doctors and naming them, but not for, for this ind individual, unfortunately. So we don't know necessarily who he is. Um, but, uh, uh, with enslaved people, uh, they're not, they might prefer to have a black uh, practitioner rather than a white doctor um, as far as the type of care that they're going to receive. Uh, they're not always going to have a say in the type of, of medical treatment that, um, that they get. So you do see them and they're well-respected and not just um, for, for their, their skill, not just by the black community, but also by uh, white Virginians too, but there's there's a bit of a, a fear there because if you know how to treat someone and you know what might save a life, there's also the danger that you could poison somebody too. Uh, so there's laws enacted in Virginia uh, against this in 1748 uh, in particular, where uh, you know if if your treatments actually harm someone. Yeah, you you could potentially face um, a rather severe punishment. So I, you, Medical liabilities, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we we do have a question from the audience. Um, so what kind of uh, uh, what was the availability of uh, medicine, medical options for the lower classes? Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of domestic practice, of course. Um, there's uh, recipe uh, recipes, which they called receipts at the time that they can find in cookbooks. And then there's others that are shared throughout their family. Uh, but you do find uh, people, no matter what their their status, they uh, there is evidence uh, of them uh, obtaining treatment from uh, pro uh, professional doctors, uh, apothecary uh, surgeons are kind of referred to as a trade slash profession, but you do see evidence of where they would, would seek treatment from them on occasion. It might be expensive. You, you have to make choices as to when you want that care and how, but uh, it, it did certainly happen. Um, so that's certainly available. There's the other thing too, is you're going to find um, itinerates uh, that come through uh, and they're not necessarily going to be quite as trustworthy because while there isn't any medical license at the, uh, at the time, 
uh, you're working with small communities. Everyone knows one another. And while a doctor might um, uh, be uh, better considered uh, you know, a good doctor, if he has a good bedside manner or he's charismatic, you know, if, if you know, he's not any good, we're just gonna get around. Um, so they, they kind of like stability. They don't really like people that kind of travel through and meander because you, know, you don't know this person, they're untrustworthy. But if, if desperation kicks in or you know, maybe, maybe you're a little more eccentric, then you might try someone who, who's traveling through and, and, and providing this kind of care. So uh, with George and Martha Washington with, with Patsy's seizures, uh, they usually relied upon more mainstream medicine, but uh, at one point they had her wear an iron ring that a blacksmith made up for her. Uh, and this goes back to some folk medicine, uh, they're called cramp rings, but it was thought to help uh, pre uh, prevent seizures. It doesn't do a look of good. And then unfortunately after um, five years of, of these seizures, uh, there was one day, it was a Sunday, it was actually June 19, 1773, which is exactly five years uh, before the Continental Army marches out of Valley Forge. Uh, it was a normal day as far as they, they figured, you know, they were having dinner in, in the dining room at Mount Vernon. Patsy gets up, she has a seizure, and two minutes later, she's dead. Uh, she died in Washington's arms. Uh, she's about 16 or 17 at the time. Uh, so, uh, but you do see a variety of different practices here. And, but just, unfortunately, there wasn't anything that they could really do for her in the 18th century. Um, so, uh, in talking about um, the types of, of medical treatment that was available to Virginia, uh, there's, there's also uh, Virginia's status as a colony. It's really impacting the type of, of uh, uh, care that Washington uh, receives. And so, uh, yeah, let me clarify that. Uh, Washington, he can go to a, a druggist or an apothecary and buy medicines. Think of an apothecary as kind of like a drugstore today. Uh, so you, you can pick up grocery items and sundries, um, but you can also buy foodstuffs and medicines. And some of those foodstuffs would also be medicines. But uh, Washington, uh, he, as a planter, he sold tobacco and he had that exported and it was uh, to uh, merchants in Britain. And what they would do is they would uh, hold that tobacco in a warehouse until it was sold. And then uh, they take out the, the fees and the taxes and then uh, any profit that Washington and others uh, would have made that would have been um, applied to their accounts from which they could purchase different items. And some of those items that Washington is purchasing are medicines. And uh, he primarily went through a London merchant house called Robert Carey and Company. And uh, what's really interesting is that uh, up until the 1760s, uh, a lot of Virginians and other colonists in the what become the 13 rebellious colonies, uh, they they really, uh, in their mind, they benefit from the, the absolute influx of British material goods coming, uh, coming uh, being imported uh, to, their, to the colonies. And, but uh, in the 1760s, you find Washington, uh, he's one of these, but also others, where they're complaining about uh, the or quality of the goods that are coming in. And on top of that, Washington is com also complaining about uh, the, the low cost uh, or, or the, the low payment he's getting for the tobacco. He, he thinks that it's better quality than what he's getting paid for. So he's complaining about these, these goods that are coming in and that's, um, that could be clothing, and other items, but some of the stuff that he, he was buying were, were medicines. And there's some issues with the medicines that he's buying. They come from all over the world. And so this is, this is an example of some of the medicines that he's purchased through Robert Carey and Company. Uh, 
Uh, Gallup is coming from an area near Veracruz today. Uh, that was a, a laxative. Uh, you have Peruvian bark, uh, of course, from Peru. It's also known as cinchona bark. Washington, he, uh, uh, he had problems with malaria. Uh, and uh, it was found that Peruvian bark was, was very good in treating it. At 1822, they're going to isolate the quinine that's right. in that. And it was, it's still used in some cases today, though they've, they've started to get away from it. So uh, was this the, the only real treatment for malaria what, at the time, Peruvian bark, like real Peruvian bark? It's one of the primary treatments that they would have had. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, Peruvian bark, it's used uh, for, for fevers uh, of all sorts to include scarlet and yellow fever, but it's only, it's only useful in intermittent fever, which is the other name for malaria. Um, so he's, he's getting that. Uh, Epicac is kind of interesting because, and that's, um, uh, that is uh, used in dysentery. Uh, today we know that uh, there's two different forms of dysentery. There's the amoebic and then there's the bacillary. And uh, there, there was this idea at the time in the 18th century, especially during the American Revolution, where they thought that dysentery was caused by unripe summer fruit fermenting in the stomach. So basically you're making alcohol. Um, and they would treat that with epicac. Well, today uh, the amoebic form is often treated with emetine, which is a derivative of epicac. So some of these things, do work, uh, not so much the jalap. Um, you know, they, they were fond of their, their laxatives. Um, they had senna jalap, Epsom salts, cream of tartar, syrup of violets. Rhubarb uh, is another uh, laxative that was uh, growing wild in China, but the most esteemed would be coming from Turkey and Russia. Uh, but that's another laxative. Um, it, the idea is, is they, they can't do anything that's truly invasive to the body. Um, so, uh, and they, they have uh, limitations in the kinds of di diagnostic tools that they have. They don't have thermometers, they don't have stethoscopes or anything. So if you've got something bad and nasty in your system, it's just best to flush it out. So that's, that's the thinking behind that. Uh, you have Spanish fly. Now, Spanish fly, it's coming from, uh, that's being imported uh, via S uh, Spain, France, and Italy. The best were supposedly from Italy. And it's, um, it's kind of famous or infamous for its treatment of venereal disease, but it was actually used for a lot of different applications. Uh, so that would be uh, for, for dropsy, uh, where you, uh, it's an accumulation of, of fluid in the soft tissues. That's uh, today we know that it's caused by congestive heart failure, um, but uh, any kind of uh, obstruction or accumulation of fluid. Uh, so in the urethra, you know, they talk about um, ulcerations in the bladder. Uh, Washington, uh, for his final illness his, uh, before he died, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, um, but uh, they actually applied a blister of, of Spanish fly on his throat as part of that treatment. So, but that's, that's the thinking behind that is that it's supposed to remove those obstructions. So with all these goods around the world, uh, I mean, obviously with the British Empire and the Navigation Acts, you know, these policies of mercantilism, you're only supposed to trade within the British Empire, right? Yeah. So, and of course, uh, you know, specifically is, England and Wales, and then there's um, Berwick-upon-Tweed, which is, um, you know, these, these two towns on the, uh, or these towns on the, the Scottish-English border, but yeah. Yeah, so if Peruvian bark or, uh, you know, a Jesuit bark, as is often called, I mean, if that is not uh, grown within the British Empire, uh, it is the only way of getting it through smuggling. Uh, you can get it through smuggling. Um, but, uh, and, and that did happen, um, but they are required by the Navigation Acts to send all of this stuff, no matter where it is, uh, to Britain and then have it come over to uh, the colonies. That's how it's getting imported. So the, the issue with that there is, is that, you know, this stuff is not only costing a lot of money, uh, but it's not necessarily fresh. Uh, and 
they can't isolate the active ingredient within it. And if you can't isolate the active ingredient, then you have uh, the issue of uh, over or under medicating yourself because they can't measure the quantities within it. Uh, so that was a very real problem at the time. And that doesn't even bring to mind counterfeiting, which I'm sure, uh, you know, counterfeited drugs uh, entering that, uh, America. That did happen. Uh, so uh, sometimes there's unscrupulous agents uh, who will try to, uh, over in, in, in Britain, uh, who are trying to make a buck. And, uh, you know, if there's something that's similar, either in smell or, or you know, it looks similar, they'll try to replace that if, if they can increase their profits or if they're, you know, they can't get a hold of the real deal. So for, for example, uh, there's, um, there's cinnamon. Now, true cinnamon uh, was, was preferred and it was used as a foodstuff, but also as a, as a dentrifice, kind of like for cleaning teeth. Not what I would recommend today because it also, while it whitens teeth, it also um, will strip the enamel right off. So, uh, but if they didn't have cinnamon, uh, they might, uh, uh, you know, adulterate it with cassia. And the issue with cassia is that uh, it has a higher amount of coumarin, which adversely, we know today, adversely impacts the liver mm. in high quantities. So these are the different issues that they're having. The Navigation Acts are going to tie uh, George Washington and other colonists more tightly to uh, the, uh, the mother country. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they're developing some independence because they have the appearance of choice. But then they're, they're getting uh, uh, the imports. They, they cost too much and they're sometimes getting poor quality goods. And that's going to be an issue. So uh, now Washington, he took command of the Continental Army on July 3rd, 1775. Uh, and as commander in chief, he had to make a lot of decisions about uh, things that impacted soldiers' health, like food storage, uh, the placement of latrines, the disposal of animal carcasses, and also, you know, clothing and shelter and whatnot. But there's, there's one thing that he did uh, during his time as commander in chief that really um, uh, helped preserve uh, soldiers' lives. And that was smallpox inoculation. Smallpox uh, began uh, spreading throughout the Continental Army with the beginning of the war, even before the Continental Army was really officially adopted. Uh, it is an epidemic disease here in the colonies because you have a small population. Uh, it comes every 10, 15, 20 years uh, once you have uh, enough people who haven't any prior exposure and then it, it really rips through that population. If you're lucky enough to survive smallpox, you have lifetime immunity, but one out of every three people uh, who caught it naturally uh, usually died. So it's a horrific disease. When the war began in 1775, uh, so you have uh, soldiers who are congregating in large groups, you know, you, these units uh, are rather sizable and a lot of them don't have any previous exposures. So uh, when Washington takes command of the army, there's, he's already dealing with a a, an epidemic of smallpox surrounding the Boston area where he took command. And it's, uh, it's already, it, it also spreads elsewhere. Uh, now, he's credited for inoculating the army. What's less well known is that he was unwilling to, uh, or hesitant to do it in the beginning. And that's because uh, inoculation uh, is different from vaccination. That's developed a little bit later on in the 1790s. But with inoculation, you're getting a mild version of the disease. Uh, with that, uh, uh, you have to be quarantined. 
for about uh, uh, three to four weeks. And uh, so it's, it's an expensive procedure oftentimes, but it would, if he quarantined, if he tried inoculation and he quarantined his troops, well, what would that do for the British? <laughs> Yeah, you're you're seeing a significant troop depletion. You know, if uh, you know a, a large percentage of your army is uh, incapable of, of fighting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, not only troop depletion, but uh, it makes his his troops more vulnerable to British attack. And the British didn't have to worry about smallpox by and large too much. They, they do uh, at times with, with uh, loyalist refugees, those who were born in the colonies, but loyal to the crown uh, and uh, uh, provincial troops uh, as well. Uh, but, you know, over in Great Britain and, and elsewhere in Europe, the population is so large that smallpox is endemic. It's constantly there. So if you're someone who's who's reached adulthood and enlisted in in the British Army, chances are you've already had either smallpox or the inoculation, so you have lifetime immunity. All they have to do is pull their troops, see who who the few, uh, which few haven't had it, and then they can inoculate them, and it's no big deal. It's not going to impact their military strength. Whereas Washington, this is a very big deal. Um, so he's he's not. Uh, he, he initially tries for uh, a strategy of, of prevention, of, of trying to keep it away from his troops. So that, that means that civilians, they're going to have to be quarantined elsewhere. Um, and, you know, letters that come in, they try to dip them in vinegar, which doesn't really work, but they thought it did. But those kind of preventative measures. The problem is, is that there are soldiers who are scared to death of getting this. Uh, and so they'll try to inoculate themselves in secret. They, they actually make the incision for the inoculation either under their fingernails or in the thigh to avoid detection. And then um, because they're getting inoculated in secret, uh, they're, not they're not getting quarantined. And so it, it, you're, you're gonna spread it uh, as a result. There are also um, some uh, continental officers who inoculated their children for fear of them getting it. Uh, and then you have a, a, a lot of movement with the civilian populace, you know, either with loyalist refugees, but um, uh, civilians who are, um, who are, who are uh, more in favor of the Patriot cause, uh, they're going to kind of congregate to their position. So there's a lot of different reasons why this is uh, going to continue to circulate and by early 1777, when Washington and the Continental Army are over in Morristown uh, for that encampment, he realizes that he has to inoculate the troops. So he puts out orders for them to do that, but then three weeks later, he countermands the order. And then a week later, he says, go ahead and do that. You know, we, we need to get this done. And the reason why he's so wishy-washy about this is because at the time, uh, if you were to release someone from quarantine after inoculation, they usually recommended some variation of the following. It, it would differ here and there, but this is what they would usually recommend. You had to have all your hair shaved. You had to be washed in a warm solution of water and vinegar, and you had to have all your clothing and bedding burned. Oh. Uh, the clothing. Where's, where's they the don't have, Yeah, they have sh clothing shortages. So yeah, that that would if you have a complete uniform, right? Yeah, that would so, be a major issue if you're you're trying to inoculate your troops and you want them coming out the other side of it with new yeah. clothing. Yeah. So, uh, but eventually Washington realizes he's got to do something, so he 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 orders the troops to be inoculated. Now, when he uh, when the army comes here to Valley Forge. Uh, uh, almost a year later, in December of 1777, shortly after they arrive, uh, they find out that there's a small outbreak of smallpox, and it doesn't really uh, go too far. Um, but uh, after there was an investigation, they found that three to 4,000 of uh, Washington's troops, despite having long-term enlistments, 
they uh, they for one reason or another they weren't inoculated, so they had to they had to do mass inoculations here. Um, so uh, and some of those might have even have occurred in in the the quarantine for that was probably it might have been in the huts themselves uh, uh, here at Valley Forge. So, uh, but uh, when they march out of here, uh, they've completed one of the first large scale uh, state mandated mass immunization programs in history, basically. Uh, this is going to help maintain uh, strength, uh, military strength for the regular troops for the remainder of the war. Not so much for the militia, but for the regular troops. Uh, so this, uh, this was quite an accomplishment, especially for uh, you know, an army trying to fight for its independence. So Washington, he dealt with a, a lot of major illnesses and maladies throughout his life, uh, malaria being one of them, smallpox at the age of 19. He uh, went with his older half-brother Lawrence to um, Barbados because Lawrence had uh, tuberculosis and he was trying to seek treatment. It's the only time that Washington ever left what is now the United States. And while there at the age of 19, uh, Washington caught smallpox. So he, he already had immunity when he was commander of the Continental Army. Uh, but uh, in, in his old age, uh, he also suffered from hearing loss. Uh, there's a possibility that might have been caused by Peruvian bark. In some cases, it can cause that. Uh, so his treatment for malaria, uh, we don't know for sure, but it's possible. Uh, he dealt with some skin conditions as president, uh, what they refer to as carbuncles or growths on his thigh. One, one in particular was really quite serious uh, and he convalesced for several weeks. Uh, a few years later in 1795, he had a facial growth removed. Um, it's possible it might've been cancer, we don't know, but uh, he managed to survive a lot longer than, uh, than most of his, his relatives. In fact, he survived all of his siblings, uh, uh, but unfortunately uh, uh, for him, uh, uh, at the age of 67, something caught up to him. So uh, December 12th, uh, he's, retired, he's retired from the presidency by this time. He's at home at Mount Vernon and he's, uh, he goes out and rides his horse. He's overseeing his property and he's out, uh, out at Mount Vernon on the, on the grounds for about five hours and the weather's really, really, really bad. Um, and when he's out there, you know, there's snow, rain, hail, uh, you name it. Uh, so after five hours or so, he comes back home for dinner around midday. And if he would have changed out of his wet clothes, he would have been late for dinner. So he instead elects to, to sit down and eat in his wet clothes. Uh, the next day, he goes out and he starts uh, marking some trees for cutting. Uh, on his property. Now, today we know that, you know, cold and wet don't make you sick. It's things like viruses and bacteria and fungi. But, you know, all this activity probably didn't help Washington's immune system any. And uh, very soon, shortly after, he develops a sore throat. Uh, the next morning on December 14th, his secretary, Tobias Lear, is, is um, called into his room. Uh, he and Martha Washington realized the gravity of the situation uh, when after they tried to give him a, a homemade remedy that's basically molasses honey and, uh, excuse me, molasses butter and vinegar, and he nearly suffocates on it. So Tobias Lear, he sends for an overseer, um, is, uh, this guy named George Rollins, and uh, he's, yeah, he performs a bloodletting on Washington. And 
shortly thereafter, they also call for uh, a good friend of Washington's, James Craig, who's a doctor, and uh, he arrives to treat him. And when he and, and uh, Martha Washington realize the gravity of the situation, they send uh, for two other doctors. Uh, so that is uh, Gustavus Brown out of Port Tobacco, Maryland. And when he was, uh, he wasn't arriving as quickly as they had hoped. So they also sent for a younger doctor named Elijah Cullen Dick, uh, who was practicing medicine in, in, the Alexand in Alexandria. Uh, so a lot of people actually think that um, Washington was bled to death because uh, of this, when he had this throat infection, he was bled upwards of four different times. And sometimes depending on the source material that you're looking at, he was bled you know, around 80 ounces of blood or as much as 126 ounces of blood. But the problem with that is that we have two primary sources to go on for, uh, with regards to Washington's death. And uh, uh, when you look at that, uh, uh, Tobias Lear, who's one of the sources, and then doctors um, uh, Craig and uh, Dick, uh, who's the second source, they differ in the amount of blood that was taken out for the first bleeding. So Tobias Lear said it was, it was about eight ounces, uh, Cullen and Dick say that it was about uh, 14 to, to 16 ounces. They don't mention how much was, neither source mentions how much was taken out for the second and third sources. We have no idea. So everything that, that you might hear about the amounts is pure conjecture. The fourth bleeding was about 36 ounces. So it's, it's a large amount. But when you look at the cause of Washington's death, a lot of medical historians, uh, they, the, the consensus is that he most likely died of acute epiglottitis. So the epiglottis is um, this, this flap at the base of the tongue. And when you swallow, it covers up the windpipe. But it's thought that that became very, very swollen. And Washington, when, when He's having this final illness. All of his symptoms are consistent with epiglottitis. Now, the bloodletting probably didn't help any, um, but in the end, uh, the only thing that could have saved this guy was antibiotics, and that didn't exist yet. Uh, Elisha Cullen Dick, uh, he did suggest a tracheotomy uh, rather than bloodletting. Blood and some of the other treatments that, that were used. Um, but the problem with tracheotomies is that it was a relatively new and novel procedure. It had only been tried a couple times. Uh, there were a lot of unknown factors. And because uh, Elijah Cullen Dick was, was the junior doctor, he was overruled by the other two. And um, uh, some people will point to, well, you know, I mean, what Dick was saying might've saved the guy, but you know, the others are more established. Um, they weren't wrong to, to necessarily to, to outrule that uh, because it was such a novel procedure. And the, the one time that I have read about this being done right about this time, they're basically thrusting a lead pipe into the throat. So it's, it's not exactly pleasant. Um, but uh, nothing really seemed to, to work. You know, again, antibiotics would have been the only thing that would have saved him. Uh, they, they did uh, try a blister of, of Spanish fly on his throat to, to just kind of try to balance things out and move things around. You know, as I was saying, um, they uh, gave him calomel to try to uh, induce vomiting. Uh, so it was not an easy way to go. Um, but the one thing I will say is that these, these doctors, even though this, this treatment wouldn't be recommended today, uh, they were attentive. Uh, they tried their very best at the time with a very difficult situation. Uh, and they were following established practices at the time. Uh, so uh, there, there are a lot of people that, that might criticize their work, but it has to be considered within the time frame in which this, this was done. So uh, I suppose we 
we're at one o'clock, but uh, if there are any last minute questions, uh, if uh, one someone wants to get one in, now might be a good time. Yeah, uh, someone made the comment that what they went by what they felt best and what they knew at the time still had to be rough for Washington himself, <laughs> which is true. It, oh, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, really, that doesn't really sound awful. like a pleasant way. No, 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 no. And uh, at one point he's like, just, just leave me alone. <laughs> You know, this isn't going to work. You know, just just let me let me. Maybe pass, he's ready. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, there there have been uh, the general consensus is ep uh, acute epiglottitis. There there have been other things that were proposed, but they don't necessarily always quite fit, or none mm -hmm. of them really fit um, his, his uh, symptoms. So one of those things was was diphtheria. But the problem is, is that Washington already had black canker as, as a, a child. Uh, the evidence seems to indicate that. And if he did, that uh, it would have given him immunity. Uh, there aren't any reports of it circulating around uh, Mount Vernon at the time or, or who he associated with. And as I understand it, it's usually a childhood disease. Mm -hmm. uh, Quincy was another one. So basically it's an abscess on the, on the tonsils you know, or an inflammation of the tonsils. But the problem with that is that it, it usually is on like one side or localized to a particular area where that, that wasn't the case for Washington. Uh, Ludwig's angina, which is an infection of the floor of the mouth under the tongue. Problem with that there is that it's usually caused by, uh, you know, some sort of dental infection or an abscess and Washington didn't have any teeth at the time. <laughs> Um, then there's, there's lockjaw, uh, there's a disease that causes lockjaw, but, you know, Washington was able to talk, so, to a certain extent. Oh, yeah. So, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask the one question that, uh, I've been curious about, uh, so one of the possible side effects of smallpox is infertility, and Washington never had any children, uh, is uh is that ever brought up much? Uh, I don't really uh, see people uh, talk about that too much. It's a little bit of an exchange. Uh, sometimes I bring it up, um, and uh, you know, with qualifiers. Um, but uh, you also have people who will ask to visitors um, that I'll I'll speak with. Uh, but yeah, so when Washington, in rare cases, smallpox can cause infertility. So there is a possibility, a possibility that might have been why he never had children. He wanted them, uh, but he never did. Uh, we, we won't know for sure exactly what, why he was not able to have children with Martha, um, but that's, that's certainly a, a possibility there. Uh, the, other, the other thing is Martha had four children. Unfortunately, they all predeceased her. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, she, she had children fine, but there might've been some complication with the last pregnancy or with her health later on down the line that we're not really yeah. aware of. Who knows? It's, it's just interesting to speculate. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, to wrap things up, uh, perhaps some, uh, book recommendations. Uh, you did mention, uh, smallpox with the Continental Army. So Elizabeth Fenn's book, Pox Americana is a must read. Uh, the U.S. Army had a publication, the Army Medical Departments, 1775 to 1818. And uh, you, of course, uh, apprenticed at one point within the apothecary shop at Colonial Williamsburg. And they published a, a book called Physic, the Professional Practice of Medicine in Williamsburg, Virginia, 1740 to 1775. Uh, another good book. Uh, so Jennifer Bolton, Park Guide. Valley Forge National Historical Park. Thank you very much for joining us. This has been great. Thank you for having me, and I hope you guys had fun. All right, take care.